Please right. welcome our presenter, Jennifer Wilkin. Thanks, Josh. Um, good morning. It's nice to see lots of names that I, a few that I know and lots that I don't know. I'm glad that you're making time to be part of the data conference with us this year. Um, my name is Jennifer Wilkin. I'm the Assistant Vice Provost for Academic Data Strategy and Decision Support. I work for Sheila Ainley, who's the Vice Provost for Planning and Budget, and have um, several teams here at ASU in the central, in central roles doing planning, um, predict, some predictive analytics, uh, structuring our data to maximize its value for student success, among other things. So I've been at ASU now about 16 years and working in data for almost 30 years. And what I'm gonna to talk to you about today really does draw on kind of the full uh, breadth of experience. This is not necessarily um, ASU specific information that I'm gonna share with you today, but I'm hoping that you'll participate. We're gonna do a couple polls. Um, it's not a huge crowd. So if you want to unmute and, and chime in, if I ask for questions, please feel free to do that. It always feels a little bit better to know there's a human being uh, behind one of these uh, one of these icons, other than Josh, of course. So, so we're going to talk a little about data-informed decision-making and more, more abstractly just decision-making in general and the way that that tends to work. So I'm going to share some theoretical models that I've come across in um, teaching one of the courses in the Higher Education Analytics Certificate offered by Mary Lou Fulton's teacher, Teachers College. Um, it's been a a fun thing to do. And um, then we're going to talk a little about some of the other elements to decision making aside from data that may uh, work in concert therewith. So uh, this, this uh, presentation, I believe, was, was pitched as a citizens and apprentices um, level session just because it is non technical. So uh, no, no need to have any, any prereqs completed to, to participate. Um, but I also welcome your participation if you are knights and wizards. Um, we all have really important roles to play in making sure that data is, is pointing us in the right direction. So everybody's welcome here. And I have no idea if that has implications as far as badges. Josh can explain that at the end. <laughs> so. Uh, we already kind of did introductions. I'm going to talk about people and context as kind of the base recipe here as I lean into the, the food metaphor as best I can. Then we'll talk about these decision-making models that were theorized by Chaffee in 1983. And then we'll talk about how data works with those models or doesn't work as the case may be. And we'll get um, some feedback from you on how you practice these frameworks. So if you go to slido.com and put in uh, event ID ASU 2021, there are going to be just three polls in the, in the first 10 minutes or so of our time together. Um, I'll also do some informal polls in the Zoom chat, so be ready for both. Um, the Slido will allow you to see the results as you, um, as you put in your answers as well. So um, hopefully you can kind of get a sense of, of where everybody is. I'm going to copy this. Um, actually, Josh, do you mind copying the link into the chat just to make it a little easier as well? Thank you. So here's the recipe that I've constructed for decision making. Um, the important theme here is that it's not just data, even if it's a very data informed decision, that the people, the context, um, and a certain element of continuous improvement is also part of what makes decisions um, better um, and better over time in particular. Chaffee, the, the, the uh, theorist that I'm going to cite today, um, talks about decisions particularly as evolving over time. And I think that's an important lens. Sometimes we think especially about data decisions as being kind of formulaic, like you plug in the data and boom, like the decision comes out. If you think about your actual experiences day to day, your experiences at work and in life, you know that that's not true. So it's a good perspective to zoom out a little bit and think about how that, um, how these different elements really play a part. Um, 
my recipe is obviously not um, to scale. So roughly speaking, this is the blend that I see working day to day. The first two parts, the people in the context are sort of like your base recipe. Like if you're making a pie, these might be the crust, right? These are always part of framing and, and, and shaping the way that we're going to go about making those decisions. So we're gonna talk about those two a little bit first. So if you haven't already pulled up the Slido, please um, answer now. It looks like we've got a, mostly people who analyze, interpret, and synthesize data, but a fair number of reviewers and reinterpreters. And 43% have said they use data to make decisions. Looks like a couple of people are still chiming in, so we'll give it a minute. I did put, I don't do anything with data on there, um, which was going to be a provocative answer if anyone had, had put that in. Um, I was ready to chime in with, you know, not just quantitative data counts. Um, remember that data can be qualitative information, insights, knowledge, all kinds of other things. Um, we tend to think about data as being the things that are stored in the data warehouse, for instance, or the, the, the data points that we're working with in Excel. And of course, it's much more than that. So most of you are analyzing, interpreting, and synthesizing. All right, I'm gonna stop that poll, but stay in your Slido. I'm gonna ask you one other angle on this question. And as you can see, I love alliteration. So everything starts with a C. Once I had six or so, you know, I just kind of had to stick with it. But aside from your role or your part in um, explicitly kind of moving a decision forward, how do you relate to the process of decision-making? So which parts have you played? Have you challenged? Have you complicated? Um, have you championed, um, whether that's for your data or for a particular decision? These are the kinds of things that people bring to the table. Um, these qualitative um, mood, moods and attitudes uh, and perspectives. Um, and this is an important piece of decision-making. Um, we are not acting in a vacuum and we're not machines. So whether you're corrupting, um, somebody answered that one, that's kind of, that's fun. Um, whether you're corrupting or championing or constructing, um, these, these actions are, are part of the equation. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Anyone wanna chime in with a comment? Feel free to unmute if you do. I'm taking a minute just to scan through as I'm talking about people, I gotta get present to everybody who's here. Nice to see a lot of you and nice to meet some of you. All right, so aside from the people, um, the second part of my recipe is context. And I use the image here that's very place centered, but this doesn't have to be just place, context can be many different, um, can, can have many different flavors. So context could be um, the fact that a, we work at ASU and we're number one in innovation. This is an important piece of our context and it does influence the way that decisions are made and the actual decisions that we come to. Um, another type of context might be um, the financial or resource constraints that are um, that are part of the decision-making landscape. Um, we're just gonna, in the, in the Zoom poll, or in the Zoom chat, sorry, um, type in anything that you think is an important element of context in your role at ASU. I'm gonna just peek at that. This, what is it about your place, your department, your culture, politics? Absolutely. Federal funding, somebody has 
I don't work much with that particular constraint, but I bet it's a, it's a real one. Research is a very particular context, yes. Many of us working with student success um, have that as a context. Uh, so this could be domain, this could be, I am, I am intrigued by the idea of place. I think um, part of our, um, our charter talks about being embedded in our community. And I think that um, thinking about that and what does that mean for the way that we make decisions and for um, what those decisions might need to take into account is also important. What, yes, Jennifer, what, uh, what is someone going to do with this information? Very, very important question. All right. So this is where it's going to get a little theoretical. Um, I like theory. I like abstraction. Um, and I do think there's a value. So whether you're inclined in this direction or not, um, if you're inclined this way, you may, you know, really want to dive in and, and read Chaffee's article. If you're not, think of this as just a way of zooming out um, because perspective requires change. And if we are in the weeds and many of us are, especially as I saw a lot of you are constructors of data, um, sometimes you can lose perspective and just backing up and asking the question, what is the decision-making framework that is, uh, that is at play here? Um, could at least help you shift your perspective, even if you don't sort of like to theorize or uh, wax philosophical about it, like some of us do. So I'm gonna do a very, very quick walkthrough of these models. Um, by show of hands, is anybody familiar with Chaffee's model? I don't see any hands. Um, the link will be will be active in the deck that I share out on the conference site, so um, so you should be able to pull it up. Um, these are the five types that she describes. Um, the first, the rational, um, has a value that is predefined. So there's think of this as a very outcome oriented approach where you're trying to maybe maximize retention rate or you're trying to minimize expenditures. Those, that, that idea of sort of max and min comes into play a lot in the rational model. Um, you would typically then be working through a, a series of alternatives in the decision-making framework, and you would find the best one by determining which one best fit that predefined goal. So that's the, that's the rational approach. Everyone knows what they're working toward, and you select the alternative um, and make the decision that best aligns with that. The collegial model um, involves a fundamental value of shared responsibility. So the idea is that the goal is partly negotiated. So there's, there's a decision-making process that includes coming to consensus about what not only the solution is, the alternative, but sort of what the goals were to begin with. So this one, um, this one um, feels more process oriented. These are all processes because decisions take time to unfold, uh, but the collegial one um, has that, uh, that sense of working through together. The political model, um, the values may not be shared. So in a political decision-making framework, um, part of what's happening and what's being negotiated is the perspective that will drive the decision. So political values, that multiplicity of opinions or of, of outcome valuation, um, and one alternative is going to win, at least temporarily, right? Bureaucratic values operational efficiency. So this one, I think of this as the incremental decision-making approach where you, you value staying as close as possible to what has worked before um, and your decision puts a lot of weight on that and then makes incremental change. And then finally, organized anarchy. Everybody has a story about one of these. Um, and I'll, I'll get you guys to share a few of your stories here in a minute, but organized anarchy is really opportunistic. So things happen 
And then we reframe and essentially decide somewhat retrospectively um, that this is the, the path we're going to stay on. But there is still a decision being made um, to embrace or ratify that, that outcome. So those are Chaffee's five models. Any questions about that? That was a very, very quick introduction to like a 20 page paper. Any questions about those? All right. Ask questions now, because I'm gonna pull you. This is not, not exactly a quiz, but um, on your Slido poll, and Josh can put the link back in if you've closed it. What frameworks have you seen employed in decision-making at ASU? And I did make this multiple choice intentionally because very, very few institutions or departments or even people operate under only one model. Typically you're drawing on one or two um, as kind of your defaults and you may partake in many of them. I'll let those answers flow in here for a minute. It's like we've got a, we've got bureaucratic in the lead. Not surprising, we're a big organization with a lot of need for operational efficiency. Fair amount of organized anarchy. So that one is still lagging. Collegial is coming in second place behind bureaucratic. Give it one, one more second here, I'm still getting new answers. Um, all right, so we're gonna work now um, into the middle part of our recipe, the part about data that connects us to this conference. So bring in the flavor. Um, they changed my original title. It had something with salt and pepper, but I can't even remember what it was now. Um, so the data in that context, in that framework, that is the result of a combination of context and people, now comes the data. So I'm gonna ask you, looking at the models here, which ones do you think um, are sort of most inclined to use data, uh, maybe lend themselves to a data approach? It's like we've got a few more rationals than others, but we everybody's hit on, every model has been selected by someone. I have found, I've taught the, the, the class now um, four times, I think, and I find that students really think that rational is the one that requires data and that lends itself mostly to, to use of data. Um, my sense is that data can bring something to every framework, um, but this is a bias, right? I've worked in data for a long time. Um, I've also seen it work though. So I feel, I feel pretty credible in saying that data can have a role in any of these models. So here's kind of how I would, would frame that. Um, the rational model, I think, um, does lend itself in some ways to data-informed decision-making, partly because it, it allows for um, sort of reviewing alternatives and maybe exploring data um, to, to help us prioritize or select from between multiple alternatives. But the other models also have more than one alternative on the table. It just may be that you have a competing sense of, um, of what the, the key performance indicator should be, right? So should we be maximizing retention or should we be maximizing graduation? Something like that that's a fundamental question about what you're trying to choose between could end up putting you in a collegial or, or even a political space where you're contending not only for the right alternative, but for the right framework for that decision. Um, sometimes those are even more important spaces for the data to be at the table, right? For the data to inform um, and to help build consensus, um, to help, um, maybe ground the sense of whether the change in a bureaucratic model is going to be disruptive or is not, or is going to, to sort of keep us close to uh, operational stability. 
Any other thoughts? These were just my, my um, the, the last row is not from Chappie. That's my, my layering on here. Anybody have a different perspective or thought about how data might fit in these frameworks? Moving on to the messy part. So at this point, we are really back to people. I called it practice and playfulness just because I wanted my recipe to be a little bit more complicated. But this is the point where now we have to keep repeating it. We have to revisit, question, um, and, uh, and move ourselves through iteration after iteration of whatever those decisions may be. Um, the playfulness is my, um, my kind of extra sauce here that, um, that I think helps us um, at times when this process can be a little bit tiring. So practice. Um, if anybody has, this may be, this is my provocative question for you. Maybe I'll get somebody to chime in. Does anybody think that decision-making does not take practice? By the way, I would be happy to uh, debate any of this. If, if one of the best outcomes that could come of this would be a presentation next year that says, nope, that Jennifer, you had it completely wrong. Decision-making recipe is completely different than that. So practice for me is really about experimenting and repeating and um, decision-making, whether it's with, with data or um, with any, on any other basis does take practice. Um, my team can tell you, I've always said, good analysis leads to better questions. And frankly, this can be exhausting. Does anybody have a data project that they felt was done and then suddenly like it's back? <laughs> um, can be a, it can be a tiring process. Um, Jennifer said, yes. Yeah, Jennifer, you and I have probably had some of those same things come back. Oh, it's never done. Yeah. One of the things that I, that I think, again, back to the, the, the perspective taking here, if you're working in data, especially if you are working in the data day after day and someone else is making the decisions, trying to connect that, you know, that, that decision-making process to your work can can help you and help your decision making part, partners. So this isn't always easy. There are you know sort of sometimes barriers to that in terms of our organizational structures. But anytime that you can create an opportunity to have a conversation, to follow through, and even in um, since a few of you did say you see some organized anarchy decision making happening, even in that context, if you can say. Um, I can see that, that we're using this data to ratify something that we had already decided. But I wonder whether next year we might take a proactive approach and monitor these metrics and, and find an opportunity to make maybe a different kind of decision, maybe a bureaucratic decision. Once we've made some big leap right into the unknown, it may be time to introduce a different kind of an approach to measuring, monitoring, and then incrementally improving a process. So, so I would encourage you to you know, find allies, find um, spaces where you can have conversations about this iterative process, because it, otherwise it can, be, um, it can be tiring. It can take a toll. Always, always room for improvement. So, now this is just, like I said, this is my special pinch. There's no cooking metaphor here, right? Um, but I do think that playfulness, fun, um, sort of some degree of levity can really help when we are in a, a profession that demands a lot of hard work and continuous improvement. So put in your chat, what are your ideas? How do you make your work fun? And how do you make decision making a little bit lighter. Come on, you guys, you have ideas. Clear communication, yep. Not taking yourself too seriously. People you work with can, can help, yes. And if the people you work with, um, 
I, I'd say sort of structurally are not the people that are fun for you. Find, find opportunities to do cross uh, interdepartmental collaboration, right? Like there are people all over ASU doing data work um, that would be happy to help and, and may end up giving you a chance to introduce a little playfulness into the landscape. Learning from others. A lot of us are really motivated by learning and that can be a different, another element to your recipe that could help. Options outside the box, that's a good one. In terms of, especially decision-making, um, going into the decision with a sort of foregone conclusion um, can be frustrating for everybody involved. So that's a great opportunity to challenge. Yes, people who work in data are definitely curious people. All right. So if you had to write this recipe, what would you, what would the balance be for you? So as a reminder, mine was one part people, one part context, one part data, two or more parts practice, and a pinch of where would you put more or less weight if you were making it? If you're struggling, think about a decision and think about these elements in that decision and how much of each is playing a role. Because the reality is this is gonna look different for different decisions, right? The framework will be different. The, the need or the um, alignment with, with data that we have might be different. Um, I think playfulness should always be a part of it. Some may need more playfulness, I agree, Sarah, definitely. So these are my, my parting words for you, and then I'll open up for questions. I think um, particularly I've got some things in here about generosity, um, and, and I think this is particularly important in sort of the the admittedly rough years that we've come through recently um, that, there are a lot of different perspectives. Um, making decisions is a complicated endeavor. Um, and, and I think sometimes because we are uh, working with the data day in, day out, um, sometimes it's easy to lose perspective and to think that the decisions should be foregone conclusions when in reality, there may be someone bringing a very different perspective to the, to the mix um, and even different data. Right, different interpretations. Oops, forgot to pause on my savoring. So, savor those moments. Um, these these may be uh, somewhat rare. I can say that in my experience, that that perfect moment when you know a decision has been made and you you can see the people, the data, the context sort of have aligned. Um, in a way that, that you feel good about. Those do happen. They may not happen every day. Um, and then it's important to just be ready to start over because it's all, uh, it's all iterative. Here's my, uh, my link to the, the article and all of my, um, I'm a big fan of Unsplash. I love their, their pictures. So these are my, uh, my recognitions to all the, all the lovely photographers that gave me those images for today. Thank you for listening.